Hello, and welcome to the SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group Bi-Weekly Sync. It is January 14th, 2021. Feels like it's a little bit extension of 2020 sometimes, but here we go. I'm your host for this call, Patrick Rogers. We have a great agenda, as always, for you today. We have latest updates around SharePoint Framework, updates from the Patterns and Practices program, new community samples. We'll do our optional picture time. And then we've got uh, three great demos from Stefan, Dennis, and David and Hugo uh, covering some really exciting topics. So very excited to see that. So let's get moving so we can get to the demos. Often we are asked, how can you participate in the Patterns and Practices program or this special interest group specifically? So the best way and my favorite way is demos. Would love to have your demos on the call. I know you are all doing amazing stuff for your customers and for the companies you work for. And uh, as appropriate, obviously you can't demo every piece of work you do just because of uh, certain concerns. But if you can demo something or demo parts of the work you're doing, love to have it on the call. I think it's amazing to see all the great work everybody out there in the community is doing. And I know it's a great way uh, that I learn stuff and hopefully everybody else as well sees all the great ways people are applying the technology and doing really fun, cool stuff to solve interesting problems. So if you're interested in doing a demo, reach out to myself or Vesa. We will get you scheduled on a call. It might not necessarily be the next call as sometimes we are scheduled a few weeks out, but do get in touch. We will get you on the schedule and we'd love to host your demo. So please reach out to us as well. You can contribute on GitHub so you can report issues, submit pull requests as well. If you see people with questions or issues that perhaps you already know the answer to, feel free to jump in and help them out. That's great community helping each other. Everybody gets answers a little bit faster and we all improve the work we're doing. And then finally, of course, we welcome your feedback on all of the things PNP. So our calls, our documentation, where else can we help? And of course, positive feedback feedback is okay too. If we're doing something you really like, let us know. We might be able to do a little bit more of it. With that, we will open up our slide of links and uh, we've got developer videos, which are sort of developer uh, topic focused videos around certain things, maybe authentication, maybe uh, making certain types of calls, uh, building certain types of components. As well, we have community videos, which are going to be all of the recordings of community calls, such as this one, our monthly calls, uh, and other community events. So those are all there as well. Open source, we've got a bunch of different repositories uh, in the kind of uh, the I don't know, Microsoft open source sphere. So SharePoint, PNP, Office Dev, and Microsoft Graph orgs on GitHub all have various repositories under them, and all of them welcome uh, contributions and feedback. So if you're interested in uh, the work we're doing in PNP, please join in, uh, help out, get involved on GitHub. Same with Office Dev or Microsoft Graph. If you're uh, excited about the work they're doing, do get involved. They're, uh, everybody's looking for involvement, looking for uh, feedback. And uh, you know, if you're interested in any of these areas, please do jump in. Uh, Everybody would be very happy and welcoming to have you participate. We also have a ton of great samples, web parts, extensions, list formatting, and Teams samples. Uh, tons and tons and tons of great uh, samples out there. I know when I am starting a solution or looking up uh, some use cases, I often start with the samples because it's a great way to see how people have already solved these real world problems. That's a lot of links. You can always go to aka.ms m365 PNP, which is the patterns and practices landing page, which will get you linked out to all of this great content, including all of the patterns and practices offerings, our community calls, our videos, all this other stuff. aka.ms m365 PNP is your main landing page for that. As well, SharePoint Framework documentation, aka.ms SPFX is a great link for your SharePoint framework developer documentation specifically. And now this is sharing is caring. So David. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Patrick. As you may know, or if you're new to the community, it is important to know that Patterns of Praxis is an open source community, which means that we are inclusive and welcoming of all types of contributions, as well as if you desire simply just to use some of the resources. But we know that along with those resources or the desire to contribute may come with a little intimidation or uh, unawareness of how to do some of those things like work with GitHub, etc. So Sharing is Caring is an initiative that's been set up and is being ran by Hugo Bernier, April Dunham and myself. 
uh, and we are focused on providing hands-on guidance in the process of using the resources and tools available to you, as well as contributing back to the community via these resources and tools. We've got a whole host of sessions available for you in January, first-time contributor, community docs, using some of the SPFX samples, which we'll see a little bit of a demo on today, and setting up your developer workstation. Coming soon are a number of sessions in addition to what you see there on the screen. We've got a new site coming, and we just had our first AMA on uh, Tuesday after the monthly call. We've got the next one set up for next uh, February, or February after the monthly call, and the PNP JS team is going to be our subject matter experts that day. So bring all your questions and we'll get answers. We'll invite you to join any of the sessions. You can register at aka.ms. Sharing is caring. Uh, they're all free and we'd love to see you. Patrick, back to you. Thank you, David, for those great updates. I'm very excited with Julie to be doing the AMA coming up uh, soon next month. So hopefully folks can tune in there, ask us some great questions. And now I'll hand it over to Vesa for SPFX updates. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. That one. So quick update in here. Um, we actually showed the slide already in uh, Tuesday's monthly community call, if you were able to join it or join us or you were seeing the recording. Um, but basically, we are now looking down on what's going to be in a SharePoint framework 1.12 and we're planning to get it out as soon as possible. And we are, so we're updating the Node.js uh, support to Node.js 14, which is the mainstream, super mainstream version right now with the Gulf 4 support as well. We're also adding a more access on the bait structure and context to avoid DOM dependency implementation. And this means that you get stuff like web part width and events being raised for your web parts whenever the section width will be adjusted by the end user. So then you can actually change the rendering of the web part based on the this white which have been uh, which is available uh, something which is actually available and has been available for first party web parts but uh, for whatever reason we didn't expose that for third party so we're fixing all of this stuff right now there's a few other properties there as well and then we are adding a support for complex Microsoft Teams solution. And this basically means if you have a Microsoft Teams solution, which consists from a SharePoint framework components, and then also Azure components, you can actually create the Microsoft Teams manifest by yourself and embed that inside of the SPP KGF file. So we actually use that rather than auto generate the Microsoft Teams manifest. And then the last, but certainly not the least, uh, we're looking into adding a support for Microsoft Teams meeting applications and meeting apps, uh, which are relatively complex to do um, uh, given the implementation, but with SharePoint framework, that should be quite easy, uh, given the fact that with an automatic, you have the automatic hosting and everything else available through SharePoint framework. But that's planned to go out, uh, hopefully in mid-February timeframe. But again, we're still locking down the, the exact tasks and uh, finalization of the, of the version, but hopefully will be certainly out during this quarter, which is by end of March, hopefully already in, in mid-February or so. But that's all from my side. Turning back to you, Patrick. Great, thank you very much, Vesa, for those awesome updates. Excited to start to see some uh, version, big version updates coming in SharePoint Framework. That's uh, been long requested, so uh, good to see that work moving forward. And now I think we'll hand it over to Julie for PMPJS client side updates. Yes, we will, and I am also wicked excited about the 1.12 drop. That's going to be really awesome. Uh, so. We are about to, Patrick, release the 2.1.0 release of PMPJS. Now, this is something that we've had in the works for several months. Hopefully, a bunch of you have had a chance to try out our beta release. There is so much in this release. It is really one that I would suggest no one take lightly. Um, you know, definitely, if you're going to try to move to this release, please test it thoroughly before, you know, rolling into production, but we're going to have iso the isolated runtimes that's been in there for several months that we've been testing, and I think that uh, that code looks really solid right now. We are also, another huge change, support for Node 15 and Webpack, Webpack 5 module resolution. That's another absolutely ginormous change that took a, a lot of time. So. Hopefully, we've got everything solid on that one. We added, uh, or Andrew, I believe, added add chunked stream for version for Node. And we did some, uh, Patrick did some performance updates for list item updates and inserts. Patrick also added the graph search endpoint for PMP graph. We have Azure MCell browser support now through, uh, through a sample. And we did a bunch of other smaller bug fixes and documentation updates. So you'll definitely want to look at our change log when that goes out on Friday. 
And I think that's all I have. Patrick, back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. And I just want to say this is not intended to be in any way a breaking release, but there are a lot of internal changes to the library. So do please uh, test it out before just upgrading and rolling into yeah. production for that. Uh, but no, no intention of breaking anybody with this release. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I meant. Very good. So CLI for Microsoft 365. Um, I will talk to that. So release new beta 3.5 with converting files to PDF using graph, send, uh, sending adaptive cards, creating Azure AD apps, passing content from files, and files using at token, uh, just like the Azure CLI does, more performance improvements, and more. So the CLI continues to grow and evolve and become a more fantastic tool every day. Uh, npm install dash g at pmp slash CLI dash Microsoft 365 at next to always get the latest beta version that is available. More information, aka.ms CLI dash M365. Definitely check out the CLI, another fantastic tool for your tool belt. And with that, we'll move over to the reusable components. React Controls 2.4.0 is out, so an accessible accordion control, a placeholder, people picker, taxonomy picker, list picker, and various fixes. Excited to see all of those. Those are, of course, uh, controls designed to be used in the body of your web part or application customizer. And then React property controls are the control designed to be used in the edit pane of your web parts. So property field icon picker, property field term picker, and list picker are all really exciting to see those get updates, improvements, and additions to the library. So check these out. Thank you to all of the contributors that have helped out here. This is another area that is great to see grow and have an increase in contributors and increase in the amount of capabilities in these controls. So it's a great way to jumpstart your project and save yourself a lot of time and get some great out-of-the-box looking functionality with not a whole lot of work on your part. So certainly check out the controls. And with that, we will move over to the community yeoman generator. And I believe Stefan is actually on the call and can update us here. Yes, I am. So with we recently, uh, on, on Sunday, we released the version 1.16 now, which also supports Angular 11. The Angular elements, be more specific, and has also now new in there for all the Angular versions because we support from Angular 6 to 11. The broad range uh, is source maps in Angular because we have two projects. One is an Angular project and one is CSPFX project where actually the output of the Angular project is included. You see now directly in, in SPFX where is the source coming from in your Angular project. It's a great work by Chandi. Uh, the, what she did there. Other than that, we have some um, minor upgrades to newer versions. So we have now uh, Fluent UI Fabric 7 in there, as well as the older Office UI Fabric versions. PMP controls have been updated. Uh, the PMP chairs has been updated, not yet to the really latest ones, and did some up, some smaller updates on Vue chairs. And future improvements uh, are the upgrade to Vue chairs version 3. Uh, and if you want to install it or use it, the PMP generator, you simply can install it with npm install minus g at pmp slash generator spfx. And if you want to find more documentation on this generator, then you can go to aka.ms slash pmp generator. And that's basically it for my update. Awesome. Thank you for that. Great to, uh, as with everything, continue to see all these programs, projects evolve and grow. Very exciting to see. So modern search, I think I am going to talk to that. So ak.ms slash pnp dash search gets you all the info on the modern search components. So these are a composable set of modern uh, SPFX web parts that allow you to build up a, a search experience for your users. So V4 release this week, so that's January 2021, um, and then you could read all the details there. It's going to have graph search API as well as SharePoint search API. Uh, it's re-architected to be a little bit more modular. You have a little bit more control. You can do a little bit more kind of templating in it. Uh, really cool to see these. Great way to build out a search portal. And as well, uh, working to have the V3 docs uh, and, and deprecation messages updated and back public. Uh, so excited to see the search work uh, coming to fruition. I know V4 has taken a little bit longer than was originally planned, but it is out and exciting to see that and start to get that used on that team as well. Please use that. Please provide any feedback you might have on the functionality there. And uh, if you're really interested in search, another great project to get involved in uh, and help that grow. 
And so with that, we will move over to the samples and that's going to be Hugo. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so we'll talk about what the SPFX samples repositories are a bit later, but uh, over the holidays, we had uh, a few updates happening. Behind the scenes, we were doing a lot of cleaning up on the samples and the metadata, and we'll talk about that later. But on the update side, uh, we've had uh, Akash uh, Bardwaj who updated the Copy Classic Link extension, and that allows you to actually create a, uh, a good old fashioned link to a document uh, from a SharePoint uh, library. There's also an application announcement update from Mike Myers, uh, who uh, updated it, updated the documentation, and that allows you to make quick announcements at the top of a page. On the web part side, we have uh, Abderrahman Mujahid, who updated the support for daylight saving times on the calendar, and the accordion section, FAQ, FAQ Builder by Ravi Chandra and Jack Finitsky, who updated the web part title, styles, and dependencies. And I suspect we're going to see a lot of updates on the web part titles because of the changes that have been happening in the look and feel on the SharePoint side. That's it for me today. Back to you, Patrick. Great, thank you, Hugo. And our next thing, I see people are already coming online here with their cameras, so our optional picture time. So if you're interested in joining the uh, picture, please turn your camera on uh, now. Uh, this is totally optional, but this is a great way to uh, you know show how many people are joining the calls and, and how uh, large the community really is. So seeing that grow. With unfortunately a limit of maximum 50 people being visible still. So I think we'll get it better sooner or later. Good to see people actually more and more people naming video. I think we're hitting the, the limit of 50 out of familiar faces. Hopefully this year we'll meet some of you face to face in a real world. That would be so, so, so cool. But at this way, one more time, I will get a, a GIF animation out of it and share it in social media. Thanks everybody. Excellent, brilliant. Thanks everybody. Let's switch on back on the on the demos. Well, and with that, uh, we can go right to Stefan's demo. If you want to take over the sharing and have sure. at it. Okay. So what you actually see here is just a cool sample because it's the out of the box web part that you got with it. But we actually, what I show you here is I do a lot of things with this. Because as you see here, actually, it is embedded on a page and the page theme here, which also has a new header that is coming out uh, pretty soon, says that it's a teal theme, but my web part is still blue in here, right? There is also one another option that you have to consider when you develop or design your web part is the section background. So when you edit the page and you go over here and say you want to edit the section, then you have different color variants, right? Uh, so you have these neutral one, you have these soft one, and you also have the strong one, which is actually inverts the complete web part, the, uh, the, the complete site theming that you have on the SharePoint side, right? Uh, and as you see now, we are, have pretty fixed colors. We don't have really uh, much control of it right now, but I show you how you, to gain control about this on this. And the web part is always blue. And we are lucky that the screen blue works somewhat, but we want to actually make this exactly to follow the, the theming pattern for, that Microsoft provides us. And for this, we actually use something which is now available in, in the web standards, which is named CSS variables. And I need want to explain you a little bit about CSS variables, what they are do. Actually, the official name of CSS variables is CSS custom properties, because it allows you to define custom properties in CSS. And I have here on a code pen a, a small sample. And what you see up here, root means the document root in this case. And I have here dash dash primary minus color is defined as pink. And this is exactly how you define a variable. So this defines my primary color as pink. Then I have another variable in here, dash dash uh, text minus color to black. And this defines actually my uh, the text color that, we want, that I want to use. What you see on the on the left side, I here I have a, a small box div with some lorem ipsum in there. And when I want to use this variables, actually, I say just background color, then use the keyword var and define which custom properties in CSS I want to use. 
dash dash primary color gives us the pink as a background for this box. And I also have the uh, color here set to the regular text color set to var dash dash text minus color. When I have an alternative boxes, and this is important even for a web parts, because I have here a, a box two, which also defines the primary color and the primary text color. Uh, and whenever you see variables inside such an element, and you always need to have a, a, a scope of such an element in there, so it just defines for this box and the following elements in there, the primary color to black and the text color to yellow. So when I copy now the box template from the first box below, actually, after I redefined my variables, you see that box is actually, again, pink with, with a black text on it. This is somehow we, are, we can perfectly scope with CSS variables where are actually our color values are effective on. Right. So right now, still blue, still the old classic Office UI Fabric uh, theme in here. And actually what we want to do is we want to enable our web part to have the theming, uh, be, uh, to, to have a, an object actually that, that provides us the theming. So the first thing in an SPFX solution, what you need to do is to enable the support theme variants. And there is one important part there because when you try, even have tried on a darkened background, uh, a regular web part which has not set this property in the manifest, then it you have always see a white background. When you enable this by the uh, support theme variants, then this white background will be automatically be gone, and you don't need to have some CSS in there that actually removes the or sets the background color to, to transparent, but this property in the web part manifest actually does this for you. So what we actually do in the web part, and we have JavaScript and we want to convert uh, JavaScript somehow to CSS back and CSS variables, variables allow us to do us this, right? So when we take a look at the web part code, so then you have to import actually uh, some objects from the ESP component base. And what you do on the init of the web part, this is a new function that you need to write. You request a service scope and the theme provider in this case. And then if you're lucky, you get, you try to, uh, you can say try get theme, uh, and then you get the theme of the current section back. And this, the thing why I say this, uh, because there's uh, some things that are actually not supported in there right now, but uh, I, I think there will be change. For example, if you have your web part on a full canvas page, then you won't get anything back from the theme variant, so you cannot use it. And for this scenario, we have a really, really old object, which is the window theme state, the theme, which actually has also the uh, CSS colors, the theme colors actually in there, and this is also supported in SharePoint 2019, right? So this window theme object exists in SharePoint 2019 still, and the other theme variants up here only exist on the SharePoint Online version. So what we actually get back from, from the theme variant, let me go over to my browser here, and we get back an object which has then in there uh, the effects, like the elevation they are defined in Office UI Fabric. We have in here even the fonts how they are defined. So we have here an object that says font large, which means the large font. We have, and this is more important, we have palettes in here. The palettes is actually the Office UI Fabric palette. And what you see here is you have a button background, you have a button border. So when you ever you need to want to create custom buttons like this, then, then you can reference these JavaScript variables, but instead of using it in JavaScript, with CSS variables, I show you a way how you can use it directly in your CSS. So what else do we have in here beside the palette? We have semantic colors in here also, because the palette only gives us a theme darker, theme alternative, uh, button backgrounds, and so on and so forth. So what I actually do, this is the, the object actually I get back when I when I request a theme and is in here. When I said try get theme, then I get the theme variant back and then I have the semantic colors, I have the palettes, I have the effect in here. There's the, the reason why I use this uh, in this area notation is because there is still, uh, there's a small issue because 
it is and should be supported in i guess in 1.12 it will come out that we have all these slots that are available on the theme variant object available in SharePoint framework for now i need to help myself and trick a little bit typescript to get access to these effects so this is actually the console debug is actually this piece that you have seen that outputs me the theme variant object in the browser and what i do now with the set css variables is i pass get the object keys from the from the theming object and write it directly to this dom element which is actually the first dom element of our web part and set style and set property this seems like for people that are aware that are set the style here that are set an inline style but what i actually do with this and with this nomenclature with the dash dash and then the key name is i just define a custom property on my dom element that then dribbles down to all the elements that i have in there right so when i actually check my web part from a css perspective what i have then is you see it here on the element on this element i have dash dash background color i have the background framework i have a link color i have a primary button background and all these theme variants are now available as a css variable okay so actually to fix this web part and make this thing seem a, a variable uh, i just have to go to my css in here and we have here by default the background color which is said it's theme dark and instead of using the background color theme dark i can say var dash dash theme dark and i actually don't even need this can refresh my page and it should green it is green now so when we take a look at all the section variants that we have in here, and I created a separate page for this, where we have a white, where we have a gray, where we have a, a, some bluish uh, soft tone, and then we have the inverted ones. So what ha happens actually here when I refresh the page, you see the first ones, this is a, some, I'm not sure if you perfectly see it, but this is a, one, a, a little bit lightish, lighter green that we have in here then it's get a little bit darker even more darker and then the inverted theme we have here just changed the background of the web part but it's actually white because it inverts our complete theme right so when i go over to my web part again then we have something like in here um uh, ms minus font color white and what i can say in here and i don't do it like this because i want to have here another thing in here i guess the button background text and i have more. so we have the theme dark in here yeah button background text of this instead of the color white i use the button background color uh, the button text color actually again i use a css variable in here and when i refresh now the page so i have the the white ones in here because the button text is white on this first three variants of the theme of the theme and on the inverted one i actually get also an inverted color for that so i get here the green one and i can do this with all the properties uh, that are or all these these ses variables that i use in here and i actually have done this already so let's take this one and overwrite this so what I have here, for example, then I have the primary button text because it's always defined in here. Then I have here the theme primary again, theme primary. I want to have a color, this is some fix because it was white in here. I want to have the primary button text. And when I compile now this, and then I have everything looking and matching perfectly theme. So there's might a little bit an issue here with, 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 the, with the contrast of the web part, but overall, this is how you can make your web part work pretty well, whatever the user chooses. And from a coding perspective, what we also have in here, so not only that I have defined in here that the CSS variables directly on the DOM element, but what we also have in here, we have here a theme provider theme changed event. So whenever the user changes the theme, it automatically changes the styling of the web part. 
and I'll show this in, in, in SharePoint in a bit. And let's take first a look at the handle theme changes. So what we have in here, we get a new object in there, which is our changed theme. And what I do then is I simply redefine the CSS variables. And because CSS variables can set at any time in the browser directly, it automatically starts all my elements that use this uh, CSS variable. And what you see here is actually, and I could do a this.render, but I actually need, don't need to do this because CSS variables is always like this. You have it defined on your page, and whenever you redefine it, all the element that use this variable, unless it's overwritten by some local styling, use automatically this, this styling. And what I can do now is here on this, on this page, I can say here, change look. I haven't refreshed it yet. I can then pick a theme, which is, for example, the red one, and automatically the web part changes accordingly to the theming that I preview, just preview. So this is the orange version. It just up, it, so it, it just triggers the event handler in my web part and then redefines the CSS variables in there. Or even if I want to use, for example, a dark yellow, which is also an inverted theme that uh, is out of the box in SharePoint available. So I have here now the yellow background. And of course I have a inverted one on the, on the, because it turns it back to light. I have the yellow one in here. And this is basically how it works. As I said, for example, here, what I have is a full canvas page and I don't have yet on a, I hope this will be fixed in 1.12, is uh, I don't have here the theme provider available at the moment. But because I have this fallback in here that actually where I use the window.theme state and we just take a sneak peek into this object in, in here, these properties actually are 100% matching what we have in the theme variant in here. So I can perfectly reuse this. And what I did here, I just used the window.theme state object, can refresh the page. And the web part here on a, on a full canvas page also get automatically becomes green. So, but what if you want to use actually this same method in Teams? Well, you can use and this web part in theme, uh, in Teams, and I already deployed it to one of my teams in here in my demo tenant. And what we have here now is the blue one, where it doesn't pick up a styling or theming like that. So what I can do now is, and I haven't refreshed this one, let's refresh this because it now supports our themes. Uh, and it actually should also support here theme as well. What I recognized yesterday, the last time I did a demo on uh, uh, on the Office Developer Bootcamp here in Vienna, is I really got the colors from Teams inside there. I so the buttons were really purple and and not blue like it is here. But it's what you see actually here. It's a little bit different blue that we have by default on our SharePoint side. Somewhere this blue must be coming from. But what you also can do in here is, for example, when I go to my settings and I want to use it on a dark theme, then this automatically also adjusts the, the, the branding of the web part uh, on a dark theme or on a light theme. And so I have one method with CSS variables that, uh, that I can use across the whole platform and always make sure that my web part are actually perfectly themed. Another benefit is this, and this is more like for people that works actually uh, with, with developers, uh, with designers together, is for example, when someone said, yeah, what, I designed a new web part for you. Can you give me, uh, for example, a complete color set so that I can use it in my design? So what you actually have to do, you just have some sort of sample web part. You can go in here, grab the style, uh, or fetch the style that ha only has the test the CSS variables on it. Uh, go in here, just paste it in, and define it as a CSS. Yeah, I uh, have some. Yeah, it doesn't know it probably. Um, but you can pass this file then to a designer and he can use it even when you just use HTML and CSS. 
What also we have in here, for example, what you see in the, the round border, uh, we have a, a property here, which means dash dash rounded corners. And let's make our web part a little bit more fluently and round the corners. So I can go in here. Uh, where do I have a border? I have here a border minus radius. Just define var minus round round corners. And refresh the page. And hopefully we see it because two is a little bit small. But I guess you get the idea. So you have everything that Office UI Fabric with the theming provides you uh, and, and can use it directly here with CSS variables. One uh, caution here is uh, the CSS variables are not supported in Internet Explorer 11, but Internet Explorer 11, on the other hand, will, won't be supported in Office 365 in August. So you still can have the border colors here defined like this. So then you have at least a fallback variant of this and then define the variables or use the variables because CSS is doesn't throw an arrow when it's simply Internet Explorer 11 ignores when some variable definition is in there that they don't understand. And that's basically it. Are there some questions? Well, I think, uh, thank you, Stefan. That was really awesome demo. Great to see the use of variables. Uh, I, I certainly am not an expert in this, so it's always cool to see the latest CSS tricks. Um, and with that, I think uh, some questions can be in the chat, but do want to bring uh, Dennis in now. Uh, so he's got some time for his demo. Dennis, if you're sure. ready. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, hello, everyone. I'll show you an open source project called Migration Dashboard. Migration Dashboard is a SharePoint web part that tracks migration progress from SharePoint on-prem to Microsoft 365. My name is Dennis Malatsov. I help my clients automate business processes using SharePoint Online, Azure services, and the Power Platform. And I live in Toronto, Canada. Let's jump right to the demo. The goal of this web part is to provide transparent experience to everyone involved in a migration project. Let me show you what I mean. Now, suppose you're a site owner and you want to find out when your site's going to be migrated. So I'm going to search for my site here. So there are several options that might be um, related to my site but I can pick the one I want. So in this case, I can even use my keyboard. Press enter and immediately I can see that my site is not yet migrated. The migration is scheduled for October this year. And I can also see the uh, future target site URL, which is a huge help already. Also, for my convenience, I have access to other important information, such as site size, number of subsites, site access status, and also I have access to interesting settings like source site settings and similar settings for the target site. If I want to review all details on a single page, I can also click on the view details. It'll open a panel, which is basically an iframe to a, to a list item. So I can get everything in a single page like that. As you can already see, this dashboard provides a lot of useful information to everyone involved in a typical migration project. By quickly searching for a site, you get answers to many questions well, in a single place. Um, now imagine you are part of a migration team. You're not a site owner. In this case, you can use this web part for things like scheduling site migrations, creating hidden nodes uh, that only your migration team can see. Uh, you can also keep track of the site stakeholders. This way, you'll always know who'll need to be notified about the migration progress. 
if you want, you can also copy all stakeholders' emails to clipboard, just like so, and then paste it to Outlook. Like that. Or if you wish, you can do the same for individuals. If you want, uh, you can also reshuffle the site owners, or stakeholders. Uh, typically, I treat the, uh, the individuals who go first as more important, or maybe site owners. And everyone who is later, they, uh, they are more maybe just individuals who need to be notified about the site pro migration progress. I can also add new site owners here, just like that. It's fairly straightforward. Can reshuffle and save it. Also, apart from the basic information, you can see important pre-migration statistics that are hidden in the checklist uh, uh, pivot tab. So you can get access to um, things like alerts, customized pages, workflows, uh, info path forms, custom master pages, and so on and so forth. All right, now let me show you where migration dashboard gets all the list of sites. Uh, there are, uh, so these are CSV reports produced by these uh, tools uh, called SharePoint Migration Assessment Tool, or SMAT. SMAT is an open source tool provided by Microsoft for free. And this is a typical SMAT report. Even though you see a lot of information right away, it can be quite overwhelming. A uh, migration dashboard solves this problem by presenting the same SMAT data in a more compelling and easy to read way, like so. Um, if I get a fresh SMAT report, I can easily upload it using scripts. There is a script uh, that lets me just double click it, and then I can provide the SMAT report location, just like so, and a target site that contains the dashboard. In this case, it's this one. And as easy and that, as that, the dashboard will get the data populated, and then you'll see everything in this matter, uh, matter, as opposed to the not very readable CSV files. Now, let me show you the source code. The project was built using the PNP SPFX Yeoman generator and the React template. The project takes advantage of uh, both the uh, Fluent UI components and the PNP components. The entire uh, SPFX solution consists of a single web part. It doesn't require any access to any Azure APIs. It uh, simply uses PNPGS to communicate to a SharePoint list or lists that are used as a data source. Uh, the PowerShell folder includes deployment scripts that let you install prerequisites. Like so. Um, the scripts allow you to deploy the dashboard. The deployment script will automatically create a site, uh, deploy a web part, add it to the page, add lists and all other important dependencies. So dependencies are installed using um, PNP templates. So if anyone is planning migrations from SharePoint on-prem to SPO, please deploy this dashboard to get an excellent self-service dashboard that um, your users should love. And you as a uh, migration team will also like because it saves you time on um, site owner communications. Awesome. This is a super cool tool. Um, I hadn't seen this, and this is really neat. So thank you for doing this demo. Really cool. Um, you could uh, 
But let's please step into David and Hugo, if y'all are ready to go. Uh, let's jump in, and I know we're a little short on time, but hopefully y'all can get that in. So thank you, uh, Dennis, for that really cool demo. That's a really neat thing there. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Patrick. Nice job, Dennis. All right. Yes, as mentioned, we're short on time, so we'll try to make this efficient as possible. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about getting started using SharePoint Framework samples. We know that there are many new ones into the community that may not be aware of these samples. And as some of the long-term veterans of the community may know, there could be some challenges in using some of these samples as well. So we wanted to show you some of the new features that have been added and also show everyone how they can take advantage of the features to better their use cases when wanting to use these samples. The uh, makeup of the samples is significant. They're by the community, for the community. As you can see, over 250 contributors, uh, we're all re really working on this together. And that's what makes it so amazing and powerful. So we encourage you to go visit some of these URLs, the aka.ms, to see what you can use uh, either starting out to learn or to use within your environment. Now let's jump over to the sample browser to begin our journey. And Hugo's gonna walk us through a little bit of that tour. So the, the, the sample browsers is a quick way to find samples uh, by pretty much any facet that you're looking for. When you, when you land on one of the sample browsers, you can see that you can find samples by JavaScript framework and it allows you to leverage the, the skills you already have in your team uh, to use a sample that can help you get started. As you can see, there's other facets that you can search for. For example, if you are using a different version of the SharePoint framework on your workstation, you can find samples by that framework. If you're looking at a sample for an other uh, version of SharePoint, or you're looking for something that was specifically designed to work on Teams or Outlook, you can also find samples by, by those uh, facets. Um, if you're looking at finding ways to learn how to use uh, PMP controls, what better way but to use a, a PMP control already used in a sample? And that's how you can do that there. Um, also, if you're looking for samples by specific technology and uh, Microsoft technology like Microsoft Graph or the Graph Toolkit, for example, or GitHub, you can see there's quite a few samples there. Uh, if you have a favorite author, you can also find your authors right here. So, for example, here, uh, Joao Mendez, who's a frequent contributor, has a lot of great samples. Uh, so that's one way to do that. Uh, finally, you can find samples by keywords. So if you're looking for a specific uh, keyword, like Content Query Web Part, one of my favorite web parts, uh, you can find it there. And you'd be surprised the keywords that return uh, some results. Like yesterday when David and I were practicing this, we were searching for soccer and we found a web part that actually uh, shows you how to get started with soccer. Now, when you click on a sample, uh, so for example, if we go onto the content query web part, you'll see that uh, the first thing you'll see is that it takes you to the repository with the source code for that web part sample. Again, let's keep in mind that these samples are intended to be used as a starting point. You, you can, if you want, use them in production, but they are absolutely intended to be a sample for you. So there's always a description. There's, uh, there's always a screenshot. Uh, often it's an animated screenshot that shows you how the web part works. And uh, below there's a new feature. Uh, we, we are starting to update every sample to add compatibility. And the reason for that is because if you've tried to use the samples in the past and maybe you tried to use an older sample and you had a newer version of the SharePoint framework, you may have ha received issues or noticed issues with compatibility. So now what we do is we highlight which version of SharePoint framework, which version of Node, uh, whether the web part will work on SharePoint Online or SharePoint 2019 or 2016, whether it is compatible with Teams, and whether it will work on the hosted workbench or the local workbench. Um, that's all included in here. And then we always have a uh, solution history with the authors. Uh, that author section, by the way, is what you should refer to if you're planning on opening an issue uh, regarding a, a web part and the version history which shows you you know all the updates that have been done so you can see this is a web part that's been updated uh, over the last four years or so and it keeps on getting better and better 
There's a little disclaimer there, and I want to point it out, right, that this, the sample code uh, is not supported by Microsoft. It's not, you know, a, a promise or a warranty from Microsoft. This is absolutely intended to be sample code. However, we do, uh, the community does try to provide support. If you go to the issues list in the repository, you can create issues and we'll try to help you. The next part here in every sample is how to get started. It's all usually called minimal path to awesome. So these are the minimal steps that you should do to get started. And with that, uh, why don't we get David to uh, show you how to get started with using a web part. David? Absolutely. Thank you, Hugo. So let's set up the context for finding some samples we would like to use. Let's begin with the content query web part. And I'm going to open this in a new tab. And then we're going to search by author, and we're going to look up Hugo. And we're also going to see that he's got a sample called Upgrade Me. So if we also search by keyword, we could do that and upgrade. We use this for our sharing is caring sessions. So as we go and look at each of these, we want to now start utilizing that compatibility section. We see that the content query web part was built on SPFX 1.11 and Node 10.x. Now, contrasting that with the upgrade me, which is a little older, we're using SPFX 141, and it, of course, uses an older version of Node LTS 6 or 8. So this is important information because historically, without this, it may have been confusing on how to utilize these samples. And you may have been using an incompatible version of Node when you downloaded the sample and when you tried to uh, gulp serve or gulp build, it may have spectacularly exploded on your screen, which we'll see shortly. So how do you take advantage of this newfound information as well as getting access to these samples? Well, let's briefly go and look at the GitHub repo. And this is going to take us to the root of the repo. And we cover this more in our sharing is caring session, so we invite you to join those. But this is your primary location. You don't have to have Git installed. You can just download the zip. It is available to you. It is a large download, so we're not going to do that now. Uh, but if you have Git installed or GitHub desktop, you can use either of these options as well. Now, I've already pre-downloaded this entire repo here available for us. I've also already installed all of the uh, uh, node modules to save us time. So we're going to quickly go into our sample here, and we're going to find our React Content Query web part. And we're going to try to uh, gulp serve it or gulp build it. Let's see right there. We see it's there. And we'll take a look just to confirm we have node and the version is 10.23, and that's what we know we needed. The 10.x is the necessary version. We're using the most recent. And so we can go ahead and typically at this point, once we've downloaded, we would do an NPM install. Now, I've already done that to save us time. We see those node modules are already loaded here. So I can just uh, do a gulp build and see if this works. Now, again, having this compatibility has helped us because otherwise we may have had to try to determine what was used to build this solution. And we may not have been able to find it, so we might have had to do some trial and error. We see this has succeeded for us. Great, that's fantastic. So now let's jump over to our other demo, the React Upgrade Me. And if we scroll down and we find that right down here, Upgrade Me, I'm going to grab that URL. And we're going to change the directory here, clear the screen, and we're going to try to do a gulp build. If we go back over to the compatibility for this, we see it's using node 6 or 8. So as this tries to, to execute, at some point here, we're going to see that it has failed on us. And it's going to spectacularly explode, and we're going to think something is wrong with this particular sample. The truth is, though, that when Hugo is importing these or publishing them, uh, they're all tested. So if something is in the sample browser repository, it has been tested and is successfully running at some point. But now we have a better understanding of why this might be failing. We're using a newer version of Node that was not necessarily compatible or even around when this particular sample was built. Well, there's a way that you can take advantage of technology and tools to ensure that you can still use this sample. You don't have to uninstall Node. You certainly could and reinstall an older version if you'd like. You could use Docker. Uh, we really recommend using NVM, Node Version Manager. It allows you to quickly switch between versions of Node. So in this case, I've pre-installed Node version 8. So I will use NVM use 8.0.0. .0 .0. And I will just approve that. 
Uh, and we see it's now using Node 8. Now, if you're not familiar with NVM, guess what? We've got a sharing is, care, sharing is caring session that'll show you how to utilize it and go into much more depth. So now if we check our version, we see we're using Node version 8. Absolutely fantastic. So now I can do a gulp build, uh, build on this. And at this point, we've already preloaded the NPM modules. Again, if I go back, we can see they're loaded here. Uh, I did that in the interest of time. And we see that it's successfully built. Awesome. That is fantastic. Success. And so now we know that we are able to utilize all this newfound information that's available to us uh, to take advantage of using all these samples. They all work. We don't want you to feel like things are broken in the repository, and they're all available there for you to be able to use. Uh, now, you may say, why don't I just upgrade this? Well, uh, we're going to talk more about that in our other Sharing is Caring sessions, and we're running a little short on time. So we're going to run back to our slides here and provide you with some links. Uh, please don't hesitate to join one of those Sharing is Caring sessions. We're going to go into even more depth on how you can take advantage of these samples and utilize them in your environment for uh, your organization or learning. Patrick, back to you. Awesome stuff. Thank you very much for that. And all the hard work on sharing is caring and keeping up the fantastic community resources for everyone. We uh, had three great demos today from Stefan, Dennis, and David and Hugo. So fantastic work. Thank you all four of you. Very much appreciate those. Uh, really interesting stuff across all those demos. I wish I had that migration uh, dashboard uh, back when I was doing all my migration work, that would have been super helpful. So uh, if you could go back in time and get that to me, that would be much appreciated. Our next call is coming up uh, next Thursday. This recording will be available in 24 hours on our YouTube channel. You can always follow us on Twitter. Our next SPFX call is January 28th. That's in two weeks at the same time. Our next general development call is next Thursday at the same time, January 21st. 2021. And then all of our calls are available on ak.ms m365 pnp. Look forward to everybody getting to catch up on that. Thank you all for watching this call. Thank you all uh, for participating in the PNP community. Appreciate everybody's hard work. And uh, if you have interest in other community calls, here's a great list of fun stuff going on across Microsoft development and Microsoft technologies. Encourage you to attend uh, any of these you're interested in. Uh, always welcome the audience. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody have a great rest of your week and look forward to talking again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.